Today on BRS TV we have episode four of our How to Start a Saltwater Aquarium series. We have Reed back again with us today. Thanks Ryan, good to be back. Uh, today we're going to add some easy to keep uh, corals to the tank. We're going to discuss calcium and alkalinity a little bit and talk about redundancy in the saltwater hobby. So I asked Reed here to order us some corals and uh, frankly he went a little bit crazy and ordered a whole bunch. Generally we only recommend adding a few pieces of livestock at any particular time. I volunteer to take some home. I sure you will. Uh, let's go add those corals to the tank. So if you watch episode two, we went over how to acclimate fish. Uh, we're going to do the same process with the corals. However, they are much more sensitive to water parameter changes, so we're going to go ahead and take our time with this one. So this time we got this cool little box, accurately called the acclimate. That's uh, some nice suction cups to go right in the front of the aquarium. Uh, then we're just going to simply take our coral, cut the top, pour the water in and gently put the coral in the inner box. There are a couple of tubes here, one draws water into the acclimate while the other one goes into the bucket where you can control your drip rate. So after your coral is properly acclimated, this inner box, you can go ahead and pull it out, it will drain out all your water, and then you can place it right in the tank. So I'd like to add one more thing to this, which is uh, coral dips. There are a lot of coral dips out there these days, but they're all designed to do pretty much two things, and that's kill parasitic and nuisance organisms before you add the coral to the tank, as well as promote coral health during the transition to the tank. So there are a lot of brands out there, and frankly I don't have any idea which one's better than the next because it's kind of hard to measure. However, uh, most of us at BRS do use the Coral X version. Uh, it's pretty easy to use. We're just going to add the appropriate amount to our acclimate here, wait 10 minutes, and then gently swish off any of the parasites that may have died and then add the coral to the tank. You know, this brings up another topic. Uh, when you're introducing a new coral, you want to go ahead and inspect it thoroughly. Uh, look for unwanted hitchhikers such as Aptasia and bubble algae. If it has either of those present, you might want to reconsider strongly adding it to the tank. Good point. There isn't a single coral that I want bad enough to intentionally introduce Aptasia or bubble algae into my tank. In fact, if I see either of those in the holding tank that the coral came from, I probably won't even put the coral in my tank at all. So, Reed and I are going to get to work acclimating all these and get the corals into the tank. So this is what the tank looks like with all the new corals in it. As you can see, it's a pretty dramatic difference. All the color and movement adds a whole new dynamic to the tank. For me, this really is the draw to the hobby. I agree. It used to be that maintaining corals like this was considered difficult. However, these days, advancement in reefing methods and equipment have made it much easier. So the primary difference between the tank that we had a moment ago, which only had fish in it, and the one we have now, which is full of corals, is this one we need to maintain calcium and alkalinity, and to a lesser degree, magnesium. So we have a couple of pretty detailed videos on the different methods of maintaining calcium and alkalinity, as well as the science behind it. There's a lot of information there, so I'm not going to try to pack it all in today's episode. However, I would recommend checking it out. Uh, we will touch a little bit on each one as well as tell you about the one that we chose for this tank. So there's four basic ways to maintain calcium and alkalinity in the aquarium. The first one is water changes. Uh, because we have so many corals in this tank, water changes probably isn't a very appropriate way to do that. There's also the uh, popular two-part and calc washer. And we have uh, the calcium reactor. I would say that uh, the calcium reactor works really well. However, we're not going to use it here because it isn't really appropriate for beginners because of the expense. And I'd say the learning curve for it is more appropriate for a intermediate level reefer. So two part is basically exactly what it sounds like. You just have a couple of jugs. One's filled with alkalinity, the other one's filled with calcium. And you add the same amount of each every day. Typically, you would do this uh, when you're doing your normal feedings. However, if you want to fully automate the system, you can use a couple of dosing pumps on timers, which will emit the same amount every day for you automatically. So Calcwasser is another option. It's also known as calcium hydroxide. Basically, just mix it with some fresh water and slowly drip it into the tank. It has a benefit of raising the pH as well, which most reefers find desirable. Um, I would say it is definitely one of the easiest and most affordable methods of maintaining calcium and alkalinity. So calc and two-part are both great options for a tank like this. 
Uh, frankly, we're going to go with Kelkwasser this time for no other reason than we already have a whole slew of videos on two-part, so this one will be a little bit more unique. Kelkwasser is great for a low to medium demand tank like this one. It's super affordable and easy to implement. Reed, do you want to go ahead and show us about the first way to implement it? Well, the easiest and cheapest method that I found uh, is you can buy a dripper or go ahead and build one, such as this one that we whipped up quick. Uh, it's just a gallon container with a couple tubes that go through the cap, and then you have a dripper on the end to control your rake going into the tank. So if you notice a long tube inside the container, we have it about an inch off the bottom. Uh, that way when we make the saturated solution of Kalkwasser, uh, we're grabbing more of the solution itself and not the sediment on the bottom. Uh, which you don't want to add directly to the aquarium. So to get the dripper going, it's as simple as just blowing on the short tube here. And then come over to your ball valve and tune it back. I like to get roughly about a drip every second. That looks about perfect. And we want to make sure that uh, it's dripping into a high flow area of the tank. When you're mixing up your saturated Kalkwasser solution, you can use up to two teaspoons per gallon of fresh water. Uh, it's really all going to depend on what's in the tank. Uh, when starting off, we'd recommend to go ahead and use just half a teaspoon per gallon and really test every couple of days to figure out how much you actually need. Kalkwasser also has the benefit of raising the pH in the aquarium. However, because of this, you want to add it at a slow drip rate like we have going here. I uh, typically like to do this at night just to keep the pH up. So that was a pretty good description, and I'd wager that's how most people typically uh, start using kelk to maintain their calcium and alkalinity. And it makes sense because it's really easy and affordable. However, after a while, you might get sick of this nozzle getting clogged up or filling the jug, and you want to find a little bit more automated solution. One of those ways is to combine kelk washer with your auto top-off system. Since the auto top-off system is already adding fresh water to the tank and evaporation is inherently slow, it actually makes a pretty good marriage because we can add the kelk washer directly to the reservoir that holds all of your fresh water for the auto top-off system. So if you already have an auto top-off system like the one that we installed in episode 3, all you really need to do is put some of the kelk washer powder in your fresh water reservoir for that auto top-off system. Uh, again, you can only put two teaspoons per gallon of water in, so in a five gallon bucket that would be ten teaspoons. However, like Reed said, I really recommend using about half a teaspoon to start with, which would be about two and a half teaspoons for that full five gallon bucket. We also want to make sure that our auto top off system is using a pretty slow pump. Uh, we want to make sure that any changes we're making to the water chemistry are happening really slow. Uh, we're using this aqua lifter here, which is basically a slow drip, so this is appropriate. Uh, we just want to make sure that we're not using anything that is just dumping in tons of calc solution in the tank at one particular time. So Reed, can you give us a few more details on how you would adjust the amount of calc washer we're dosing to meet the demands of any particular tank? Well, it's pretty simple. We recommend keeping your calcium levels at about 420, your alkalinity at about 9 dKH. Uh, you can use test kits such as this one uh, to go ahead and test your levels. The best bet is to start off slow, uh, test every couple days, and just adjust from there. For example, if you're using half a teaspoon of caulk washer per gallon of fresh water, and your levels in your tank continue to drop, and go ahead and bump that up to even three quarters of a teaspoon per gallon, I shouldn't take more than a handful of adjustments to really find the perfect amount. So many people think that testing and dialing a calcium solution is really intimidating. However, really it is exactly that easy. Find a starting point, Test and adjust. Shouldn't take more than a week or two to figure out exactly how much you need. So the next thing that we're going to cover here is redundancy. So on a long enough timeline, basically every single piece of equipment that's on the tank is probably going to fail at some point, especially things with moving parts that are submerged in salt water. So we need to take some steps to protect ourselves from any of those equipment failures. Especially because if you've made it this far, you're probably pretty committed to the hobby and really in love with your tank. So what we're going to do here is add some redundancy to that auto top-off system that is now dosing kelk washer solution. 
Uh, basically what we're protecting ourselves from is a, either one of those float switches that are in the tank from getting stuck with salt creep or snails. If they get stuck in the on position, uh, the auto top off system could potentially dump in all of that five gallon bucket into the tank. Not only would that probably cause uh, a lot of harm to the tank, it could actually flow over onto our floors and uh, ruin your carpet or hardwood floors. So the way we're going to do that is with a pH controller. I have one here from Pinpoint. It has a nice digital readout of the pH of the tank. All you need to do is suction cup the probe into the tank somewhere. Also has a couple of outlets on the back and the unit's actually capable of turning these outlets on or off based on the pH of the aquarium. So we're going to incorporate that with our auto top off system to add some redundancy. So if the auto top off system were to ever get stuck in the on position due to snails or salt creep or anything getting all over those float switches, what would happen is, is it would continually dump fresh water with kelk in it, which would raise the pH of the tank. However, the pH controller would be able to recognize the elevated pH and turn off power to your auto top off system if it were plugged into the unit. It's that type of redundancy that really ensures that our aquarium is going to be around for a long time to come. So while I have this pH controller in my hand, I wanted to touch on how nice it really is to have a digital readout of the pH of the aquarium that I can see fairly easily. Generally speaking, you can have a healthy aquarium anywhere between 7.8 and 8.3. Having this digital readout makes it really easy for me to walk by and just see if it's outside that range. Uh, particularly if it's falling below 7.8. I know there's probably a problem with the aquarium and this is going to give me some time to catch it before it becomes a real disaster. I want to touch on what Ryan just said about redundancy. I do agree 100% that it is a key to a long-term successful reef tank. If you plan ahead for equipment failure, you can avoid a lot of those disasters. So that about wraps up today's episode. In the next episode of this series, we're going to add an aquarium controller to this system, and we're going to talk about how if we were smart, it would have been there from the beginning. If you want to make sure that you are notified when this comes out, subscribe to our YouTube channel or newsletter. Thank you for watching BRS TV.